Hello, this is Chuck Ridgway, Automation Technology Manager at Horner. Thanks for joining us for another Tuesday live stream. Well, we've got a good topic for you today. Here it is. Today, we're going to talk about string handling and structured text. Yes, in 2024, you still have to be able to deal with strings as an automation engineer. It seems a little old fashioned, maybe, but there's still plenty of applications where dealing with strings is very important, whether you're talking about dealing with barcodes or maybe some sort of a card reader, or maybe you're printing to a serial printer for receipts or something like that. There's still plenty of applications where you need to be able to deal with string handling. Now, in the past on this channel, we have covered string handling with Variable Based Advanced Ladder, which is one of our more popular languages. But a lot of folks really like IEC and structured text for IEC is really one of the languages that's the most conducive to string handling. So that is why we're going to cover the topic today that we are. All right. So we're fully live today. So if you have any questions and you're watching live, give us those questions in the chat section. If you're watching this on replay, like a lot of you do, give us those comments and questions in the comment section. Again, we're fully live today. Now, I will be pre-recording next week's show because I'm going on vacation. This is I'm, I'm old, and this is my 50th year of being a Detroit Lions fan. So I'm heading out to San Francisco to see the championship game, which is the first time the Lions have been in it since I was in my 20s. So I'm not going to miss this opportunity. But anyway, let's go ahead and break down today's topic on string handling and structured text. Okay, so we're going to start by reviewing real quickly what we mean by string handling. We're going to start with the native structured text string functions that are built into Cscape IEC programming. And then we're going to talk about some user-defined function blocks that we've added that you can download that will make your next project using structured text and strings even easier. And there'll be plenty of demonstrations throughout. All right, here we go. Okay, so what do we mean by string handling? Well, effectively, we mean the manipulation of string type variables. And string variables are based on ASCII encoding, where each character in a string is typically encoded as a byte value. So it has some sort of decimal value between 0 and 127, which is the biggest number you can fit into a byte. And that represents a specific character. Maybe it's printable, maybe it's not. Now, with Cscape's standard IEC editor, Strings are handled as short integer arrays. So it's an array of characters where each character is represented by a short integer, which is another name for a byte. Now, strings are also terminated at the end with the null character, which is effectively ASCII zero or decimal zero. Now, here's an ASCII character table, which is always one of the tools of the trade when you're going to be doing any kind of string handling. And we're showing a chart with ASCII values from 0 all the way up to 127. And you can see it's a mixture of characters that are printable, like numbers and letters, and ones that aren't, like carriage returns, start of text characters, delete keys, and those sorts of things. Okay, now, where are strings still useful in industrial applications? Well, I talked about some of them in the opening. Certainly barcodes, reading and writing RFID tags reading cards, whether it's some sort of a magnetic-based card or something else, serial printing applications for receipt printing, and satellite communications. We did a session on satellite communications a while back, and with satellite communications, every byte that you transmit costs money, so therefore you very often need to do some kind of advanced byte encoding and some byte handling and string handling, which is very precise, and using these string functions is one way to get that done. Okay, so let's talk first about some of the basic string handling functions that are built into the standard IEC editor in Cscape. All right, so let's start with one that you can use to calculate string length or what's the length of a string. It's called string length array. And you can see what the syntax looks like there on the screen. So when you're using this particular function, you are going to have a source string in the form of a short integer array. That's the input to the function. The name of the function is string len a for string length array. And then the output of the function is going to be the integer length of that particular string. And you can see the assignment statement format for the syntax for this particular function. 
So again, if you want to know what is the length of this string, what's the length of this barcode that I've just read in, for instance, from my barcode reader, you could use this string length array function to determine the length of that string. Now let's say you want to compare strings. So maybe you've got two different strings and you want to see, are they equal? Do they match character for character? So you can use another function. This one's called the compare string functions where you're comparing a string against a variable string. So in this scenario, again, if you look at the syntax on the screen, you'll see it's written in the form of an assignment statement where we have a variable called match that we're going to be setting to either a one or a zero. So that's a Boolean variable there. And we've got two inputs to our compare string function and they're both variables. So both variable arrays of the short integer variety, both a string of characters. And if they happen to match, then this function is gonna return a one for the output. In this case, for what's on the screen here, we're assigning that one to the variable match. Now, maybe you want to compare a string, but instead of comparing it against another variable, maybe you want to compare it against a fixed string, okay? So you would use a slightly different string compare function. This one is string compare constant, where your first input variable is a character array, but your second input is just a fixed string. So it could be, for instance, in between single quotes, it could be something like A, B, C, D, E. So maybe you are reading in a barcode and you want to see if the value you read in exactly matches some specific fixed string. And if you want, were interested in doing that, you could use this string compare function here where you're comparing against a fixed string value. So that's another useful function. Now, the next functions we're going to talk about are actually user-defined function blocks that we have added that you can download to your project if you have string handling you wanna do with our standard IEC editor. But before we get into the details of these specific user-defined function blocks, let's talk a little bit about the syntax you need to use if you're gonna call a user-defined function block in structured text. Now, we love user-defined function blocks on this channel, and we cover them a lot, and we've covered them extensively in variable-based advanced ladder and even in ladder in IEC. But what we haven't really talked about much is using them in structured text. So let's take a look at the syntax here on the screen. So what we've got, if we take a look at that first line, is we've got a UDFB called mid, and then in between those round brackets, you've got four input variables separated by commas, n, e, n, in underscore array, len and position, okay, all abbreviated there. All right, so there's four inputs to this user-defined function block, and the user-defined function block happens to have two outputs. It has an output called ERR for error, and it has an output which is an array string, which is, again, a string type output. Now, you can see there on the screen in line two and line three, the way we are retrieving the outputs of the UDFB is we're using assignment statements. So we've got a variable called error, all spelled out there, and we're assigning the ERR output of the mid UDFB to that particular variable. And on the next line, we have our output array. We've got a variable called output array, and it is effectively mapped to the output array of the mid function block. So this is more or less the syntax that you would use if you're calling function blocks, UDFBs that is, within structured text. However, this is just kind of the syntax. How you would actually code it is a little different. So let's take a look at that here. So and this, is, this would be actually a snippet of code from a structured text routine that is actually calling a UDFB. Now the UDFB it's calling is the mid UDFB, and we'll describe that a little bit later. But when you're actually calling a UDFB from structured text, and you do this in ladder as well, you actually call an instance of the UDFB. So if the UDFB is mid, you need to create an instance of that UDFB. I've called this one mid underscore FB. And then in your program variable listing, that mid underscore FB that I've created is set and typed as mid because that's the name of the UDFB that it is an instance of. Okay, so my syntax, you can see there on the screen, I'm calling mid underscore FB. I've got four inputs within round brackets. Those are the four input variables that are assigned to that function block call. And one thing you'll notice is those four variables that are listed in there, none of them match exactly 
the name of the inputs as they're defined in the function block. So if we go back one slide and take a look at that syntax there, those are inside of round brackets. Those are the exact names of those input variables. And you'll notice on the next slide, when we actually code it, we don't match those variable names exactly because that is a error in the IEC compiler. So we've got still four input variables, but they have slightly different names. They don't aren't given the same name as the actual uh, variables themselves. Okay, and then we also have our assignment statements starting in the second line where we've got a, that error variable we've created that's tied to the ERR output of the function block. And then you'll notice that our last assignment statement is actually within a loop. And that's because for these UDFBs that have a character-based array or a string array as output, you need to make sure that assignment statement is within a loop so that we can retrieve those characters one at a time. So effectively, we're executing in this example on the screen, we're actually executing 32 of those assignment statements as we retrieve each character at a time to create our output string that is the output of this UDFB. So that is kind of the syntax of what the UDFB calls look like, and then specifically how you would code them to make them come out the way you're looking for. All right, now let's take a look at the specific UDFBs that we've created and that are available to you if you've got a string handling application with standard IEC that you'd like to use. So let's start with the first couple of UDFBs that we've created are ones that are useful when you are parsing incoming strings. So maybe you've got a barcode you're reading or a magnetic card reader or something like that, and you've got a string of characters, and you know that maybe the part number or the inventory location or something else is embedded inside of that string, and you want to extract that portion of the string and use it for that particular purpose. So you need to have some instructions that allow you to extract characters from somewhere inside of that entire barcode string that you've just read in, for instance and mid is a popular one. Now, for those of you who maybe took basic in junior high or something like that, you'll know mid dollar sign or mid string was a function available in basic. It's also available in a lot of IEC editors. And effectively, it's a function block that allows you to extract a series of characters from somewhere inside of a source string. So the UDFB is called mid. And then it's got four inputs. It's got an enable input because it only operates on the leading edge of enable, okay? It's got a source string called input array. It has a length input variable, which specified how many characters are we gonna extract from the source string. And then it has a position variable that specifies where within that source string is the first character we're going to extract. And then the two outputs, there's an error output in case you specify a string that's too long or something like that. And then there's also that output array that ultimately will need to be inside of a loop so that you can extract each character you're extracting as part of that loop. Okay, so that is the mid instruction for extracting characters from the middle of a source string. Now, similarly, we have a couple other UDFBs that are useful for extracting characters from a string. The first one is called left. So in this case, we're not taking characters from the middle of a string, we're taking them from the beginning of a string. So maybe the first five characters, the first three characters, whatever the case may be. So this particular UDFB is called left. Again, it has an enable input, it has an input array input, and then it has a length for how many characters we're gonna extract, but we don't have to specify the starting character because it's always starting at the left. So very similar to mid, but it always grabs from the left side of the string. Now. Similarly, we have a UDFB called right, where we're grabbing characters from the far right of the string, so from the very end. Now, they're still being returned in the proper order. It's just when we specify a length in terms of the number of characters to grab, we're going to grab that number of characters from the end of the string instead of from the beginning. So that's the right UDFB that we've created as well. Okay, so now let's go into Seascape and take a look at how these are coded when you're actually going to utilize these UDFBs in your logic, the mid, the left, and the right. So here we are in my logic program, which is based on structured text. Now, as many of you know, with IEC in Seascape, you have the ability, like in most IEC editors, to specify different languages for different sections of code. So I've created a main loop module called STDemos, structured text demos, 
And this is where I'm doing all my function calls to demonstrate the different string handling functions. Now, how do you get these string handling UDFBs into your project to begin with if they're not part of the native instruction set? Well, you need to import them. Okay, so there are UDFB files that you can import. They'll be available for download from our website. They're probably already up there if you're watching this on replay. And when you import those, you're going to go to the logic modules area of the project navigator. You're going to right click and you're going to hit import logic modules. And then you'll navigate to the folder containing the files you downloaded that are the UDFB files, and you'll grab the ones that you wanna to add to your project. Now I've already grabbed these before today's show, so I don't need to import them again. But once you import them, then they'll show up under UDFB modules right here. Okay, so the first three I've grabbed are mid, left, and right. So let's take a look at how those are used here. Now, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, when you are utilizing UDFBs in your logic, you don't call the UDFB directly, you call an instance of the UDFB. So down here in our program variable window, somewhere down here, let me scroll down, we're gonna have to create instances of UDFBs. Okay, so here's mid underscore FB, left underscore FB, and right underscore FB, okay? And you'll see the type of variable for each of those variables I've created is mid, left, and right. So when I go to define those types and I go to the pull down list. Once I've imported those UDFBs into my project, they show up as a type that I can grab from the list. So that's how that works. So we've got mid, left, and right. So that's the first three we're going to show you. All right, let's take a look at the syntax. It's pretty straightforward. So mid underscore FB, again, that's the instance of our function block. Here's the four variables that are the input variables for this particular function call. The specific variable for enable the specific input array variable. Uh, and you'll notice there's no square brackets. You're not putting in the first element of that particular string array. It's just the name of that particular string array variable. You don't have to do the square brackets. Then we've got our length variable. How many characters are we gonna grab? And from what position are we gonna grab them as a start? All right, so that's our function call, UDFB call for mid. And then, we have our assignment variable or assignment statement, I should say, for retrieving the error flag to finding out if there's an error. Okay, so that's how we do that, right? So here's the variable that I've created for my project. Here's the function call for the instance of the function block. And then here's the output name exactly, which is ERR. And of course, anytime we have assignment statements, we always have to make sure we have our semicolon at the end. And then this is our last assignment statement. The output of this is an array. And so we have our output array here as part of a loop, right? So uh, we've assigned an output array variable here, and here is the output called out underscore array. And then we've got our index inside of our square brackets, because as we loop through here from zero to 31, this is a string that can be up to 32 characters long. We need to execute that assignment statement once for each character we're retrieving as an output, and that would, in this case, would be 32 times. Okay, so that's our syntax, and it's exactly the same for left and for right. Okay, no differences there, but of course, we're just calling different instances of some slightly different UDFBs. All right, now let's go take a look at the bench and see what it looks like as we demonstrate those UDFBs. Okay, so here, if we take a look at the string, or at the screen, I should say, my input array is shown in that top data field there, and you can see its current value is A, B, C, D, E, F, all right? And then after I execute the mid function, the output array will be shown at the bottom. And then I'll need to specify how many characters I wanna retrieve or extract from that string and at what position I'm going to start. And you can see that's currently set for three and one. And then the next thing I need to do is just enable this function call which I've got a mid push button, which is effectively turning on the enable bit. So let's go ahead and execute this and see what we get. Obviously we're retrieving three characters starting at position one, so we get ABC. If we start at position three, we get CDE, because we're starting at position three. Now notice, that this is a one based position variable, right? So even though arrays are zero based, when we specify for this UDFB what position we wanna retrieve, that is the one based position, okay? So the third character, all right, in this case, gave us an output of CDE. Okay, so this is the mid, 
We'll take a quick look at left and right. You'll see the operation would, should be just what you expect. Okay, if we're gonna pull three characters from this particular string, and we don't specify location because with left, it always starts from the left. All right, we're getting ABC. Again, just as what you would expect. And then here, if we're gonna extract the five characters starting from the right of the same input string, what are we gonna get? Obviously, B, C, D, E, F is what we get. All right, so those are the mid string, the left string, and the right string functions, all very handy uh, whenever you are parsing a larger string and you wanna extract a portion of the characters from that string and use it for some other purpose. All right, now let's talk about another UDFB that is available to you, and this one is called Concat. What this UDFB does is it concatenates two strings. So you start with two separate strings and you execute the concatenate UDFB and it puts those strings together as one longer string and stores it in an output variable. And that's basically what this UDFB does. Now, the one other thing that it does for you is it also tells you as part of its output, as a second output, it tells you the length of the string that it's created. So if you started with a five character string and a six character string and you execute a concat, you're gonna get 11 characters at the end of that, right? That's what your concatenated string is gonna be. So your output length is gonna return an 11. Okay, again, this is useful, but in this case, it's useful in reverse. So this would be useful for building a string. So maybe you are gonna be sending something to a serial printer or sending a special series of characters to a serial device and you have multiple data fields you're pulling from and you want to take those and convert them to strings and then cram them all together and then send them out the serial port well concatenate instructions could very well be an integral part of that logic so that's concatenate let's just take a look at it in seascape all right if i scroll down here and look at the syntax for concatenate Again, I had to create an instance of the concatenate UDFB after it had been imported into my project. That's down here in my program variable listing. And then I have my inputs, which in this case is just an enable and then two input arrays. I've got two outputs, actually three. I've got an error output using this assignment statement. I have the output length using this assignment statement. And then I also have, of course, my output array, which is inside of my loop. Again, making sure that this output assignment is executed once per, for every character that I'm gonna be retrieving. All right, so that's the syntax we have there. Let's take a look at this on the bench. Okay, so here's our concatenate statement, or at least the, the screen that's gonna help us demonstrate that. We've got two strings there at the top, in one and in two. And if we execute our concatenate, you know, we can see we've created a new output string that is the combination of those two. And it tells us also that that's nine characters long on our output side of things. Okay, so that is the concatenate UDFB. Again, it's most useful for building strings to send out your serial ports or to printers or whatever the case may be, maybe to a satellite receiver. All right, so let's head back to the next UDFB we want to look at is actually the last UDFB I'm going to review with you today. And this is one called find character. So when would you want to find a character within a string? Well, you would want to find a character within a string if there's a specific character that has meaning. For instance, let's say you've got a barcode that you scanned and you know that after the capital X, you've got four digits, which represents a serial number for maybe the component that you're reading in the barcode of. So you want to find the X in the string and then you want to execute or you want to do another function to maybe extract the next five characters after the X. Well, you've got to find where that X is first. So using a function like a find character function could be useful for that. Okay, so as you can see here on the screen, the find character UDFB we've created for you has four different inputs and enable an input array, which you're going to find a character in the last position that you wanna check as well as the character you're gonna look for. Now, why would we care about last position? Why would we just have three inputs, maybe enable input array and the character we're looking for? Why do we care about the last position we're checking? Well, what happens if you're checking a string for a certain character and it isn't in there? 
you want to make sure that as you search character by character through a string that you're not overrunning that string array, right? That can cause a loop problem and it might cause you to have an exception in your program. So we have this last position input variable as part of this UDFE as a safeguard to make sure that if the character we're looking for isn't in the string, that we'll get back some sort of notification of that without causing an exception error. So with the way this function has been written, if the character you're looking for in the string is not found, you will get a minus one as one of the outputs, the output for the position for that character you're looking for, instead of being the character, the one base character within the string indicating it found it, it would be a minus one indicating it didn't find it. And because you specified the last position to check, let's say you have a string that can be a maximum of 32 characters long, you would set last position to a value of 32, and then you'd be confident that the function would never check beyond the 32nd location in an input array. All right, so that is the find character UDFB. Let's take a look at how that would be coded in Seascape. Once again, you need to start by importing it into your project from a file, creating an instance of that particular function block. In this case, I've done find character FB, and then this particular code is a little simpler because the outputs from the function block are all simple variables. You know, the error is just a Boolean. The character position is just, I believe, a double integer. So there's no need to have any kind of assignment statement within a loop because you're not pulling an output string as one of your outputs. So here's our function call with our one, two, three, four input variables. And here's the two output variables that we're retrieving, the error and the character position that we're assigning to unique variable names. All right, so let's head back to the bench. All right, and let's take a look at find character. So in this scenario, we've got our same input string we've been using for all of our demonstrations, and we've set last position to 32, just as a safeguard, so we won't go past the 32nd character in this string. You're almost always gonna set that to the maximum length of the string that you're checking. And then the character we're gonna find in this case, we're gonna make that the F, so that should be one, two, three, four, five, six. So hopefully we'll get a value of six back for the position. And we do. Okay, what happens if we look for a character that isn't inside the string at all? Well, we get a minus one, indicating that it was not found. All right, so that is the find character UDFB. That basically wraps up the material that I wanted to cover with you today. So with string handling, I've gone through three native functions that are built in, one of which was a function that allows you to find the length of a string. The other two were for checking to see if strings match either against another string or against a constant string. And then we covered user-defined function blocks that are available for you to download that you can use in your projects for extracting characters or for concatenating existing strings, or for finding a particular character within another string. And between those instructions, whether they're the built-in ones or the UDFBs, you should have no problem in doing whatever you need to do for your string functions in your logic. Now, for those of you who are interested in using enhanced IEC, there are a whole additional set of instructions that are also available for string handling. And I'm gonna review those with you in a couple of weeks. So again, today was all about string handling in standard IEC. Many months ago, we covered string handling in variable-based advanced ladder. And in just a few weeks, maybe two or three weeks, we'll talk about string handling in enhanced IEC, where you can use everything you've seen today, but you've got some additional options as well. Now, one other little thing I wanna cover as part of our wrap up, and that is to remember, when you're creating variable names for your input variables and your output variables, when you're using UDFB calls, make sure those variable names you create aren't exactly matching the variable assignments for the UDFBs that you're calling because there will be an, a syntax error. You'll get a compile error if you try and do that. Okay, so that's our wrap up today. All right, this is the portion of our program where I remind you that we're here every Tuesday at two o'clock, whether we're fully live like today or pre-recorded like we will be next week. However, we always have somebody standing by to answer your questions. And we love to see those questions in the chat section for those live viewers or the comment section for those folks watching on replay. 
Now, the training schedule for 2024 has been set. We've got a class coming up in February as a basic course and an advanced course coming up in March. So don't wait to sign up for those courses. You don't want to miss the opportunity and have them all full before you get a chance to sign up. And those courses do have some slots available, so don't hesitate to sign up. All right, now, there are many ways to interact with Horner online and via social media. Of course, there's our main website at www.hornerautomation.com where you can learn how to buy Horner products. You can search through our video library to find out if there's a video for the topic you're looking for. We've got case studies and documentation and product information and everything else. Also, of course, you have the Horner APG YouTube channel with all of our automation and lighting content. You know, hundreds and hundreds of videos up there these days. And you can also interact with us on LinkedIn. We're up over 3,000 followers on LinkedIn, and we're very active on that social media site. Okay, so next week, we've got our second in what is going to be three consecutive structured text topics. In this particular topic, we're going to talk about find operations. So how would you program find operations using the structured text language in IEC? So that's what we're going to be covering next week. Okay, if you haven't done so already, don't hesitate to subscribe to our channel. It doesn't cost anything. And if you choose subscriptions or you choose notifications, I should say, when you subscribe, you'll be notified every time we go live and every time we post a new video. So until next week, when again, we talk about find operations um, and search operations, uh, let's all get out there and let's do us some good. Okay.